Yo, treat prophecy above all the hypocrisy. Republican democracy, the government is watching me. Spit like a veteran. Commercialism virus hit in medicine. Preach on streets and they let him in. Somebody let him in, they done slipped up bad. Because I spit for my heavenly dad, the devil mad now. Name irrelevant, but since you need a title, my government barbed up. And go when the guard come, I'm spitting with guards on to the nation's video station. So each, each year, when the waters of the flood would recede, leaving, of course, the fresh minerals and nutrients in the waters, which would then cause the food to grow, and spring would be a beautiful time in Egypt because of the waters of chaos, they celebrated the coming of the waters of chaos, bringing the new life. They call that celebration in Egypt the Arca Noah. Not the Ark of Noah, but Ark of Noah. The Ark of Noah celebration was the coming of the great flood that washed away the old world and brought new life, and therefore Egypt was born again. I'm willing to overlook the fact that I can't find any reference anywhere to Ark of Noah except for Jordan's own book, That Old Time Religion, page 53, where he refuses to provide any documentation there as well. I went to Blavatsky to see if that's who Maxwell is plagiarizing from, and sure enough she states in an Icy Sun Veil, Volume 2, page 145, but she doesn't give a single reference either. She's talking in the context of the ancient flood narratives, and all she says is that the Arga represents the moon, or quote, feminine principle, and Noah is the quote, spirit falling into matter, end quote. All this aside, this whole thing is completely ridiculous, considering the Hebrew word for Ark is Tiava and Hatyavah is used throughout the text in question, for example Genesis 6.14. The word Ark was not used in Hebrew, therefore there can be no connection to Arka, which probably isn't a word to begin with. One interesting point that we might bring out is that the Hebrews, when they were in Egypt, were of course subject to the religion of Egypt. And at that time, Isis, spell I-S-I-S. Isis the female personification of wisdom, from whence, of course, we get Mary in the Catholic Church, the mother of God. Isis was the female personification of wisdom, spelled, as I said, I-S-I-S. Later on, with the coming of Pharaoh Akhenaten, or Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten changed the worship in Egypt from Isis to amen Re or Amun-Ra, of course, this is where we get the term Ray, R-A, or R-A-Y, for sun ray. So Amun Ray became the chief deity of Egypt. Now, once the Hebrews left out of Egypt and went north into Palestine, they found a new god there of the Canaanites, a god that is referred to as the Ugaritic god of the uh, Middle East. That god was El, or the planet Saturn. The Hebrews then picked up the worship of the planet Saturn, or El, the Ugaritic god, and combining the Isis worship with the Amun-Re worship, and, la and lastly with the El, Saturn, or the, or the god El, they formulate their new land based on the three concepts of God, Isis, Re, El or is ra -el, I -S -R -A -E -L. That's a wonderful theory that sounds great. I mean, it sounds well planned, and it was articulated nicely, but it's just simply not true. You see, the problem is Isis is a Greek and Coptic reconstruction of the Egyptian name Usat. Isis was not pronounced Isis in ancient Egypt. Therefore, the name Israel could not have been influenced by the name Isis in antiquity. Now, the correct etymology of the word Israel is the following. Israel derives from the Hebrew Yisrael, he that fights with God, which in turn derives from Sarah, he fights, and El, God. This is with respect to Genesis 32, where Jacob wrestled with God. It has nothing to do with Isis or Ra. And his full name is Amen Re, spelled A-M-E-N-R-A. -E the Pharaoh said that when he prayed to God, you must pray through the Son of God, Amen Re, because he represented God. And at the end of the prayer, in the ancient temples of Egypt, they would say, Amen, the Son of God, the Eye of Re, that we pray to and say, Amen. This is a lot like the last one. 
Almond is a Greek reconstruction of the original Egyptian word yam anu. It's like the word uset, which is reconstructed as isis in modern English. It doesn't actually reflect the original Egyptian pronunciation. Almond was not pronounced almond in ancient Egypt, therefore the Hebrew word almond, which only means truly or so be it, and isn't strictly religious like Maxwell says, couldn't have been influenced by the Egyptians. Mr. Michael Chandler. Solomon, wise King Solomon, is the sun in three languages. Sol, sun. Spanish, sun. The Eastern religions, Om, they chant Om for the sun, and Om, he's Egyptian for the sun. Yeah, Jews never actually used the word Solomon. The Hebrew word for Solomon is Shalomo, which as you probably guessed comes from the same root as the word Shalom and means peace. Solomon is a modern Greek and Latin reconstruction. The word Shlomo doesn't contain Sol, Om, or On, and the Eastern religions don't chant Om anyways, they chant Om, A-U-N, and this is in reference to monism, not the sun. To add insult to injury, the Egyptian word for sun is not On like he says either. It's Ra. Jonah is an example of the sun going through the equinox. Jonah is Semitic for the sun. This one's garbage as well. The name Jonah comes from the Hebrew word Yona, which means dove in Hebrew. No reference at all anywhere says that it means sun. Well, no reference besides Blavatsky's magazine Lucifer in the March to August 1889 issue, page 411. But even she just says that Jonah represents the sun, and she doesn't try to pause it in etymology. The Hebrew word for sun is Shemesh. Jesus is called the Lamb of God the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now you talk about an old concept and an old motif, that certainly is. Virtually all the ancient religions in the world had a Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, Buddhists today, a very ancient, ancient priesthood, far, far in excess of, of uh, Christianity existed in the Himalaya mountains where the Buddhists have a religious leader called the Dalai Lama. Dalai comes from the word, Latin word meaning God. Dai, Dalai, God, Lama. A Lama is like a lamb. A Lama is a lamb. Therefore the word Dalai Lama is God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world. It's a very old and widespread concept. The word Dali comes from the Mongolian Dali, meaning ocean. It's a monistic allusion to the Dharma. The word Lama derives from the Tibetan meaning chief or high priest. No reference anywhere says anything about it having any connotation to Lamas, which is just ridiculously stupid. As if Buddhists appeal to some form of blood Lama atonement or something. So that's about every etymological claim that Jordan Maxwell makes in this film, and you'll notice that they're all completely wrong. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel the lion's breath all on my neck, tracking my steps, cause these cats are pilk if they feel you ain't real, capocentric, only till we see your dollar bill, then it's hold your own in the zone where every man's for self in the world that starts. Look at it this way. Would you consider running your business according to an instruction manual written some three to four thousand years ago, and then translated twenty or more times before you read it? I very much doubt it. Yet many of us unquestioningly base the entire conduct of our lives on just such a manual, a collection of stories called the Bible. No atheist scholar would ever make this sort of a fatuitous claim. The New Testament is the most accurately received book in antiquity. We have over 5,700 original language Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, and over one million quotations of the New Testament from the Patristic Fathers alone. That's 5,700 for the New Testament just in Greek. Guess how many original language manuscripts we have for Aristotle? Seven. And that's considered to be excellent. The Roman historians don't do much better and average around 20. For Levy we have 27 and the earliest from him is the 4th century. For Tacitus, we have only three, and the earliest manuscript for him is the 9th century. By far, Homer's Iliad is the best attested ancient work second only to the New Testament, and for it we only have 2,200, and our earliest manuscripts for the Iliad are about five times more removed for the originals than the New Testament manuscripts. 
If you throw out the New Testament, then you instantly have to give up every single work in ancient history before the printing press. And again, no one's really arguing that the New Testament is unreliable in transmission. Anthony Flew, for example, the most famous defender of intellectual atheism of the last decade, was asked if he disputed the transmission of the New Testament text during his debate with Gary Habermas. He responded that he didn't doubt its transmission by any means, and that it was the most accurately handed down work in history. And even popularist critics like Bart Ehrman will agree with the modern consensus of New Testament textual criticism on the general reliability of the New Testament. Daniel B. Wallace, head of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, and one of the foremost experts on the Greek language in the world, states, quote, We can know with certainty what 99.5% of what the original text said, end quote. And, quote, No cardinal or essential doctrine is altered by any textual variant that has plausibility of going back to the original. The evidence for that has not changed to this day, end quote. As for the Old Testament, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint material to refer to. Due to the strict scribal practices of the Jews, we have an excellent transmission for it as well. To show how ancient Egypt and its religions permeates the Old and the New Testament, here are some examples. During the rule of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten came an important religious change. Pharaoh Akhenaten was a very important pharaoh. He single-handedly changed the worship in Egypt from the worship of many gods to the worship of just one god in particular and to the exclusion of all other gods. The name of this god was Re. Pharaoh Akhenaten established that from now on there is only one god, the sun, and his full name was Amen Re, spelled A-N-E-N-R-A. -E the pharaoh said that when you pray to God, you must pray through the son of God, Amen Re because he represented God. And at the end of the prayer, in the ancient temples of Egypt, they would say, Amen. Along with the coming of Pharaoh Akhenaten, or Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten changed the worship in Egypt from Isis to Amen Re, or Amun Ra. So Amun Re became the chief deity of Egypt. This is a bit funny. The whole reason they're making this argument is to try to ground their claim that the Hebrew word Amun is actually a reference to the Egyptian god Amun, and therefore Jewish monotheism comes from Amun-Ra worship during the reign of Akhenaten. The problem is that Akhenaten did not establish Amun or Ra as his god as they claim. He passionately abolished Amun worship and set Aten as the only god to be worshipped. That is what his name Akhenaten means, spirit of Aten. Now taken consistently, this refutes Maxwell's claim that the word Israel contains the name of the god Ra, and likewise lays waste to the claim that the Hebrew word Amen comes from Amen worship, which we already debunked by way of etymology in part 1. Akhenaten himself claimed to be a god, which isn't quite consistent with his own presumed monotheism, but that aside, there are no small number of issues with this general theory that somehow the Hebrews could have obtained their monotheism from Akhenaten. For one, Akhenaten's presumed monotheism died with him. Everything he established was resisted and was immediately undone after he was succeeded by Tunuk Khamen. Tunuk Khamen was probably Akhenaten's son and his original name was actually Tunuk Aten, which means living image of Aten. Once Akhenaten died, however, and polytheism re-emerged and Egypt returned to its traditions, he changed his name to Tunuk Khamen, which means living image of Amen. Without getting into all the issues here, you can read up on why Akhenaten couldn't have influenced the Hebrews in the Tectonics article at the following footnote. I will leave this with the following quotation from Donald B. Redford, who isn't particularly sympathetic to Christianity or Judaism, and is regarded as the, quote, foremost authority on Akhenaten, and was awarded the, quote, best scholarly book in archaeology, end quote. Quote, these imaginary creatures are now fading away one by one as the historical reality gradually emerges. There is little or no evidence to support the notion that Akhenaten was a progenitor of the full-blown monotheism that we find in the Bible. It has its own separate development. Quote, the historical Akhenaten is markedly different from the figure popularists have created for us. To make of him a tragic Christ-like figure is a sheer falsehood, nor is he the mentor of Moses. End quote. The ancient calendar didn't start with the year of January, or Janor, the double-headed god of Rome, as we do. Instead, they started their calendar in a different constellation. To be precise, the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. Consequently, the Egyptians and the ancient Sumerian cultures said that the Son of God, who died on the cross and was resurrected in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of a virgin. This is why in front of a pyramid you have a sphinx. The sphinx has the head of a woman and the body of a lion. This symbolized the zodiac overseeing the pyramid because, as I mentioned, their zodiac began with Virgo, the virgin, the head of the sphinx, and ended with Leo, the lion, or the body of the sphinx, which symbolically was the complete zodiac. What Partridge adorably fails to mention here is that in antiquity this virgin actually had a beard, and fragments of that beard are housed in the British Museum. I can't find a single source anywhere that indicates in any way that it may be a woman, let alone a virgin. There is a general agreement among most Egyptologists that it is Pharaoh Khafre, but that it is a pharaoh is not disputed. The whole point of the Sphinx is to immortalize the pharaoh's sovereignty and power, not to mention he is wearing the royal headdress of a king. To add insult to injury, the twelve signs of the zodiac weren't invented until much later. The Babylonians had developed 18 constellations, which were reduced to 12 constellations by 600 BC. But the constellations themselves are much different than the modern signs, which were even later developments. The Sphinx was created within the ballpark of 2,000 years before the constellations had even been divided, much less ascribe their Greek signs. In addition, to make matters even worse for this theory, according to James Holden and his history of horoscopic astrology, although the Egyptians had, quote, mapped the sky into constellations, most notable of which were the 36 deacons that were originally used to tell time at night, the early Egyptians had no astrology of their own and little astronomy, end quote. Nicholas Campion concurs that Egyptian culture didn't incorporate astrology until the Ptolemaic period, and further states that the astronomy of the Egyptians was, quote, relatively simple compared to the Mesopotamians, and this is one reason why the Egyptians never developed their own astrology, end quote. These ideas were primarily first introduced to Egypt in the first century before Christ. The earliest Egyptian zodiac we have found is the Dendera zodiac, which dates to 50 BC. The high priests of Israel would go out in the morning mist to find the manna from heaven. Those of you who have had the opportunity to study carefully will know that the word manna from heaven actually means mushrooms. The manna from heaven was actually a mushroom, sasilabin, the magic mushroom. And there's many books have been written about the subject of the magic mushroom in the Middle East. And I think we all know that in the Middle East there, had, there is the problem with hashish for thousands of years. And the drugs have been uh, floating around the Middle East for thousands of years. As we see pictured here, a, a drawing of the high priest of Israel. This is what the high priest of Israel looked like you will notice that he is wearing a peculiar headdress. The headdress is because of the manna from heaven that the high priest consumed in their worship. Uh, we find it in the Bible, the magic mushroom. Uh, we find in the scriptures that that which is referred to as manna from heaven is a word which means mushroom. Therefore, the high priest of God would go out in the morning, and of course, that's where mushrooms grow, is in the midst, in the dew, in the morning. And they would pick the mushroom, the manna from heaven, and of course, consuming the manna from heaven, they began to talk to God. Did you catch that? He moves on from that last characteristic, which was from heaven, and just simply says, because you could talk to God. Because it helps with his shrooms or manna theory, but... The text in no way indicates or implies or suggests that manna had any purpose for talking to God or any other spiritual connotation whatsoever. It was strictly used for sustenance. There are many problems in the text itself with trying to make mana psychedelic mushrooms. For instance, neither the psilocybin mushroom nor the Amanita muscaria mushroom will grow in the desert. It also makes it quite clear that they used manna every day for food. This would not be possible with either one of those mushrooms in nutritional value. In addition, in Exodus chapter 16:31, it says the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Anybody that's ever eaten psychedelic mushrooms will tell you they taste like a lot of things, but like wafers made with honey is not one of them. It's important to realize that the Israelis were told to eat one omer per person a day of manna. An omer is the equivalent to about 3.5 dried liters, or 3.7 quarts. This is well over the lethal dose 
of either the psilocybin or the Amanita muscaria mushroom. And even if you didn't die from eating that many mushrooms, you would have little to no nutritional value in either one of those varieties. And here are the priests of, of Israel. Here's the Hebrew priest of Israel wearing a mushroom on his head. The mushroom headdress. I've often wondered, see, because the mushrooms were hallucinogenic, uh, a hallucinogenic drug. <clears throat> and I've often wondered, is that why they call the priest high priest? <laughs> I'm only addressing this one because I've actually received emails from people telling me that this is where the Hebrew term, the high priest, came from. Even Maxwell seems to know that this is an impossibility and is only using it as a bad joke because the term high priest, you must first realize, is an English slang term, the word high. In Hebrew, the word for high priest was gadol, which means great or large in number, intensity, loud, older, importance, that kind of thing. As far as their hats, kind of, sort of, maybe looking like mushrooms? I'm just not even going to address that. We should also take a moment to stop and realize that Maxwell's main source here in trying to connect psychedelic sex worship with Judaism is the conspiracy theorist John Allegro and his book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. In the book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, Mr. John Allegro, who was commissioned by the State of Israel for research, substantiates the taking of the magic mushroom by the ancient Semitic fertility cults in their sex worship which predated and influenced modern-day Judaism. Allegro is only mentioned in sardonic context among scholars, and many of his theories and claims, especially regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls, have been disproven. Gary Habermas elaborates, quote, When John M. Allegro wrote The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, he was greeted by intense criticism from his peers, even though he admitted that his views were only speculation on his part. In England, Allegro's thesis was dismissed by 15 experts in Semitic languages and related fields. They judged that Allegro's views were, quote, not based on any philological or other evidence that they regarded as scholarly, end quote. The book was also, quote, met with scathing criticism in review after review, end quote. And as John A.T. Robinson concurs, mentioning Allegro's volume in a section of his book entitled, quote, The Cynicism of the Foolish, end quote, and asserts that if such reasoning was found in other disciplines, it would, quote, be left out of court. Even the front page of John Allegro's website states, quote, the reaction to the sacred mushroom in the cross ruined Allegro's career. It keeps me striving forth. I see the nails through Messiah's cross. Then I think about the whips and the rips and the blood drips from his toes, lips, on down to his fingertips. Now I'm focused, calm and cool. But I ain't anybody fool, and I don't batter any form of Roman rule. So when I say Christ Jesus, don't get it twisted. I'm talking about the Son of God, not legalistic. There is virtually not one concept, belief, or idea expressed in Judaism or Christianity, not one, that cannot be traced back many, many times to many different religions. Baptism is, of course, being submerged in water. The ancient peoples re related that when a child is carried in a womb, it is sealed in water. And that's the way you know a child's going to be born is when the water breaks. And so, therefore, water was always associated with new life, being born. And that's why when you are converting from the evil old world uh, to Christianity, you must, be, you must be born again. You are baptized. It's actually a very ancient motif. It's at the school of Amen, if it was soot, or if it soot, and other temples, where the priests also baptized the initiate once they finished 40 years. This is long before John the Baptist. I went to Walter Burkett, the German scholar of Greek mythology and emeritus professor of classics at the University of Zilrich. In his work, Ancient Mystery Cults, which is still considered a base scholarly text in Hellenistic religious studies, he dismisses such sensationalism. Quote, Concerning dying with Christ and spiritual rebirth, there is as yet no philosophical historical proof that such passages are directly derived from pagan mysteries. It is appropriate to emphasize that there is hardly any evidence for baptism in pagan mysteries, though this has often been claimed. 
Of course, there are various forms of purification of sprinkling or washing with water, as in almost all other cults as well. But such procedures should not be confused with baptism proper, as a symbol of starting a new life. The water receptacles and sanctuaries of Isis, again suggestive of baptism to our eyes, were used to represent the flood of the Nile, as wild study has shown." End quote. These adorable doctrines of the mystery schools that Maxwell's little theosophical recruitment film here is trying to brainwash you into zealously believing, first found wide expression in the German religion Geschlechtsschule, which flourished at the end of the 19th century. Expectedly, as a scholarly approach, this method of attempting to attribute ancient pagan myth to the origins of Christianity died with the progress of archaeology and is today universally considered a dead and failed approach to Hellenistic study. It is only modern popularists like Maxwell, Akaria S., Bobby Himmett, Peter Joseph, Christopher Knight, Robert Lomas, Asher Kwesi, Michael Tessarian, Ray Hagens, and other members and promulgators of the esoteric doctrine taking advantage of the public's ignorance that are able to make these ridiculous claims about Jesus being a copy off of pagan gods. T.N.D. Mettinger, a senior Swedish scholar professor at Lund University and member of the Royal Academy of Letters, History, and Antiquities of Stockholm, wrote one of the most recent academic treatments of dying and rising gods in antiquity that has been endorsed even by Richard Carrier. Mettinger admits in his book, The Riddle of the Resurrection, that the consensus among modern scholars, nearly universal, is that there were no dying and rising gods that antedated Christianity. They all post-dated Christianity. Despite all this, Mettinger said that he was going to do his best to take an exception to that nearly universal scholarly conviction. He took a decidedly minority position and claimed that there were at least three and possibly as many as five dying and rising gods that predated Christianity. In the end, after combing through all these accounts and critically analyzing each of them, Mettinger concluded that none of them could possibly serve as parallels to Jesus, not one. He concludes his exhaustive survey by stating, quote, there is, as far as I am aware, no prima facie evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct, drawing on the myths and rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world." End quote. Gary Habermas, who specializes in surveying the consensus of New Testament scholarship, elaborates. Well, I've done a count recently of uh, 1,200 sources on the resurrection, everything published since 1975 in German, French, and English. And I went back and I looked. How many of these scholars who hold university chairs, for example, how many of them who are not Christians, who do not hold to the resurrection, how many of them would say that in any way the mystery gods are, are a potential inspiration for Christianity? And I can count the number of skeptics on one hand. I can count them on one hand out of 1,200 scholars. So now that you have an idea of what scholars think about this approach, let's look at some of these claims. And all of the other saviors of mankind are just too many. They go on and on and on. In fact, let's compare them, shall we? Let's compare Jesus of Nazareth with Horus of Egypt, with Krishna of India, and with Buddha of the Orient. Horus baptized with water by Anup. Jesus baptized with water by John. As we have previously mentioned, there was no form of baptism in the Egyptian mysteries, and there is no mention in any of the horse myths about a baptism. This theory originates from the 19th century Gerald Massey, who was merely a poet and possessed no formal training or academic position in historiography. Not to mention, he was also chosen chief of the most ancient order of Druids from 1880 through 1906. He makes this claim on page 186 of his book, Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, but no substantiation is given. We find that Massey was also a popular writer for Blavatsky's Lucifer magazine. The following two websites will pay a combined $2,000 to anyone who can produce a single primary Egyptian text substantiating a baptism for horse. It's just simply not in the myths. Anup the Baptizer, John the Baptist. Anup is a poor transliteration of Anubis that circumvents the Greek. Anubis was an embalmer, not a baptizer. There is no mention anywhere in any text of an Anup the Baptizer. You will never see anybody offering a primary reference to such a name because it's simply a hoax. Again, the aforementioned two websites will pay $2,000 to anyone who can provide a primary text for this claim. Horus born in Anu, the place of bread. Jesus born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. This one also comes from Massey's book, page 710. It is incorrect. Anu, which is more properly transliterated Ianu with an I, it's the original Egyptian name of Heliopolis. It does not mean the place of bread like Bethlehem. In Egyptian, it means pillar. 
Horus identified with Tat or Cross. Jesus identified with the Cross. I can't find anything at all on this one besides this single entry to it in the Theosophical Dictionary. The implication is that Horus was crucified, which is completely false. He never actually dies in the myths, and the following two websites will pay you $2,000 again if you can provide a single primary text showing that he ever was crucified. The claim that the symbol of the cross for Christianity comes from Egypt is ridiculous in and of itself, being that you would have to somehow show that when the Romans were inventing crucifixion, they for some reason relied on this aforementioned Egyptian symbol for some strange reason. It just doesn't make any sense. Twelve followers of Horus. Twelve followers of Jesus as the twelve disciples. There's a $2,000 reward for this one as well. Glim N. Miller responds, quote, My research in the academic literature does not surface this fact. I can find reference to four disciples, variously called the semi-divine Hiroshimsu, meaning followers of Horus. I can find references to 16 human followers, and I can find reference to an unnumbered group of followers called Mesnui, or blacksmiths, who accompanied Horus in some of his battles, although these might be identified also with the Hiroshimsu. But I cannot find 12 anywhere." End quote. It was a common Pharisaic practice for rabbis to take for themselves disciples to preserve their teachings. Jesus certainly took 12 as a messianic symbol for the 12 tribes of Israel. As Richard Carrier notes, one may be tempted to claim that the 12 tribes may represent the 12 signs of the zodiac, but this is impossible being that the formation of the 12 tribes of Israel antedated the division of the zodiac into the 12 signs. Horus of 12 years, Jesus of 12 years. The implication here is that he was a teacher at the age of 12. He never taught in a temple, and certainly not at 12. He was hidden in the papyrus swamps until he was old enough to rule Egypt. If you can provide a primary text for this one, you can also claim the $2,000 reward as well. Horus made a man of 30 years in his baptism. Jesus made a man of 30 years in his baptism. Again, like most of the others, you can claim a reward, and there's no concept of a baptism in Egyptian religion. Horus the cursed, Jesus the Christ. You must first realize that the Greek word Christ means anointed. It is the Greek equivalent for the Hebrew word Messiah. The word Chris in Egyptian means burial. It is not a title, and it certainly isn't equatable with Christ. Nor is Horus buried or killed. The star, as announcer of the child Horus. The star in the east that indicated the birthplace of Jesus. There's no reference to a cave or manger in the birth story at all. None of these details are present in the ancient Egyptian stories of Horus. He was born in the swamps of Chemnitz. His birth was not heralded by an angel. There is no star to announce his birth. Again, if you have any primary text for a star signaling his birth, you can claim the $2,000 reward. Horus walking on the water. Jesus walking on the water. This one comes from page 831 of Massey's book, where he talks about how the sun reflects off the water and it appears as if it's walking on the water. Which, that in and of itself is a pretty weak and contrived argument. Then you have the problem that they are equating Horus with the sun god Ra in order to do it, which is simply incorrect. Horus was the sky god, not a sun god. There is another god, Ra Harakti, who is a little bit of both. These people never point you back to a concise primary text, they just drop these claims like a ton of bricks. Once you chase down their sources, if they even have any, they never support what they claim. Acharya S. made the same claim in her book, Relying on Massey. When she was asked directly several times if she could provide a primary text for Massey, she refused to respond. Horus transfigured on the mount. Jesus transfigured on the mount. For those of you who know anything about Egyptology, this one's particularly comical. You must realize that there was no concept of a glorified body in Egyptian religion that the Jewish idea of transfiguration refers to. To the Egyptians, the afterlife was similar to earthly life. They continued with material things, they could feel pain, and there was no idea of a Jewish end of time, rather a cyclic view of time. Nicholas Purin states, quote, The hope of the deceased was not for a better state in the underworld, but for the continuation of earth-like existence in the Thonic realm. It was through their funerary preparation of rituals that the Egyptians sought to recover, maintain, and perpetuate the comforts of earthly life. This transfiguration claim comes from page 193 of Massey's book. Then it gets regurgitated by Maxwell on page 14 of his book. Neither of them give a primary text, and Massey's is particularly ridiculous. On the same page he equates Ra with the Holy Spirit, and states, quote, Horse rent the veil of the tabernacle, end quote. Of course he never cites a primary source for any of these either. The whole claim is simple. On page 193 of Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, Massey talks about the transformation into the incorruptible Sa'u body 
in the quote, twinkling of an eye, end quote. He makes it clear several times that he's taking the Egyptian Sa'u body to be the equivalent of Jewish transfiguration. I won't quote the entire passage because it's quite long, but I would beseech you to read this scholarly article in the following footnote by Nicholas Purin that refutes this exact claim that was first promulgated by Wallace Budge. Purin concludes by stating, quote, The very point of Paul's contrast between the incorruptible body and the corruptible body lies precisely in the fact that the former, as opposed to the latter, is free of destruction or harm of any kind. In the Egyptian understanding, the mummified body was constantly subject to possible injury. The dissimilarities between Paul's incorruptible body and the Sa'u could hardly be greater. He also states, quote, Budge is misleading when he describes the Sa'u as, quote, henceforth an incorruptible, end quote. And he also notes that if we are to equate the Sa'u with the spirit body, then we must conclude that all of Egyptian existence consisted of having a spiritual body. Buddha was born of the Virgin Mary, who conceived him without carnal intercourse. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, who conceived him without carnal intercourse. First, as Edwin M. Yamauchi notes, quote, Buddha's birth is often called virginal, but that's not accurate. Buddha's mother had been married for many years prior. She certainly wasn't a virgin. I don't think anyone can make a convincing case that the virgin birth of Jesus was derived from any pagan or other sources, end quote. According to Ashvagosha, who wrote the primary Buddhist text, Buddha's parents, quote, tasted of love's delights, end quote, before Buddha was born. Thus, Maya was certainly not a virgin. Second, the name Maya is not equatable with Mary in any way like they say. Maya is a common Sanskrit word meaning illusion. Mary is a Greek form of the Hebrew name Mariam, which most likely means bitter. The only similarity in these two names is the letter M. Thomas Bruce Looper is a liberal professor who wrote a book on the virgin birth, although he rejected its historicity. He scoffs at such suggestions that it was derived from pagan myths, quote, Contemporary writers invariably use only secondary sources to verify such claims. Those attempts used by those who wish to perpetuate the notion that the virgin birth in the New Testament has a non-Christian source is characterized by brief word, phrase, and sentence quotations that have been lifted out of context or incorrectly translated and used to support preconceived theories. Sweeping generalizations based on questionable evidence have become dogmatic conclusions that cannot be substantiated on the basis of careful investigation." End quote. When Buddha descended from the region of the souls and entered the body of the Virgin Maya, her womb assumed the appearance of clear, transparent crystal on which Buddha appeared beautiful as a flower. When Jesus descended from his heavenly seat and entered the body of the Virgin Mary, her womb assumed the appearance of clear, transparent crystal on which Jesus appeared beautiful as a flower. The comment about Buddha being in the form of a crystal is doubtful, but that aside, where on earth do we find this stated in any of the Gospels or anywhere else that Jesus was in the form of a flower, or that his mother's womb was in the form of a crystal? The son of the Virgin Maya, on whom, according to the tradition of the Holy Ghost and descended, was said to have been born on Christmas Day. The son of the Virgin Mary, on whom, according to tradition, the Holy Ghost had descended, was said to have been born on Christmas Day. Most scholars place the historical birth of Jesus sometime in the late spring. The date of December 25th was set up in the middle of the 4th century by the Catholic Church to replace the Roman Saturnalia Festival and even they knew it wasn't Jesus' birthday. We have a hard enough time judging what century Buddha was born in, much less the day that he was born. Traditionally, his birthday is celebrated on May 8th, not Christmas. When Buddha was an infant, just born, he spoke to his mother and said, I am the greatest among men. When Jesus was an infant in his cradle, he spoke to his mother and said, I am Jesus, Son of God. For this parallel isn't parallel at all. Nowhere is it ever stated that Jesus came out of the womb speaking. The birth of Buddha was announced in the heavens by an ostrium which is seen rising in the horizon. It is called a messianic star. The birth of Jesus was announced in the heavens by his star which was seen rising on the horizon. There's simply no mention of a celestial sign in the Buddhist text. In one version, Brahmin look for signs of the Buddha on Gautama to determine if he will be a king or religious leader. But these signs are merely physical markings that Buddha would have, not celestial signs. Quote, they asked the Brahmins to observe the marks and characteristics of the future Buddhist person and to prophesy his fortune. If a man possessing such marks and characteristics continue in the household life, he becomes the universal monarch. If he retire from the world, he becomes a Buddha. End quote. 
In a second version, the gods sent miraculous signs through nature, but the appearance of a star is never said to have guided the prophet. This messianic star claim is easy to refute because we are told precisely what these signs were. Quote, Two streams of water bursting from heaven, bright as the moon's rays, having the power of heat and cold, fell upon that peerless one's benign head to give refreshment to his body. The gods held up a white umbrella in the sky and muttered the highest blessings on his supreme wisdom. Then, having learned by signs the power of his penance, this birth of him who was to destroy all birth, the great seer Asita came to the palace of the king. Thus the great seer beheld the king's son with wonder, his foot marked with a wheel, his fingers and toes webbed with the circle of hair between his eyebrows, and signs of vigor like an elephant." End quote. Finally, no concept of a messiah appears in Hinduism or Buddhism and is exclusive to Judaism. It's ritually ridiculous to equate the many Buddhas with the Jewish messiah. When Buddha died and was buried, the coverings of the body unrolled themselves and the lid of his coffin was opened by supernatural powers. No version anywhere states this. Yamauchi responds, quote, Buddha became mortally ill after a meal of pork, perhaps from dysentery. After his death, Buddha was cremated and his ashes distributed among eight cities. His alleged remains were venerated at various stupas, or shrines throughout Asia. Buddha ascended bodily to the celestial regions when his mission on earth was fulfilled. Jesus ascended bodily to the celestial regions when his mission on earth was fulfilled. Being that his body was cremated and disseminated to eight cities, I tend to doubt that he ascended bodily. Quote, and they burn the remains of the blessed one, as they would do for the body of a king." End quote. According to Buddhism, nirvana isn't a physical place, but a mental state. It should not be confused with heaven. Buddha is to come upon the earth again in the latter days, his mission being to restore the world to order and happiness. Jesus is to come upon the earth again in the latter days, his mission being to restore the world to order and happiness. This is deceptive. A Buddha will return again, but it will be a different human Buddha. The Pali Canon records 28 past Buddhas that have come. This is nothing comparable with the Christian Parousia. And Jesus isn't coming to restore order and happiness. He is coming to bring chaos and suffering to the vast majority of human beings. Buddha was visited by wise men who recognized in this marvel and infant all the characters of divinity. And he had scarcely seen the day before he was hailed God of Gods. Buddha was not a god. He never claimed to be a god and he never called himself a god. Buddhists don't concern themselves much with God, and it is a common mistake upsetting to Buddhists for Westerners to think that Buddhists consider him to be a God. As for the wise men, in one version an aesthetic, not wise men, visits the king to relay the information that his child will become a great religious leader. After hearing this, a large number of Brahmin decide to dedicate their sons to the Buddha, depending on whether the Buddha becomes a king or religious leader. Quote, a son has been born in the family of Sudhudana the king. Thirty-five years from now, he will become a Buddha. Whether the young prince becomes a Buddha or a king, we will each give a son, so that if he becomes a Buddha, he shall be followed and surrounded by monks of the warrior caste, and if he become a king, by nobles of the warrior caste." End quote. In a second version, at Gautama's birth, a seer, again not wise men, simply tells Sudhudana that Gautama will become a great religious leader. Quote, the great seer came to the palace of the king, Thy son has been born for the sake of supreme knowledge, having forsaken his kingdom, indifferent to all worldly objects. He will shine forth as a son of knowledge to destroy all the darkness of the world. Buddha is Alpha and Omega, without beginning or end, the Supreme Being, the Eternal One. That's an amazing way of ascribing the Greek alphabet to an Indian monistic sage. But how exactly can Buddha be the Supreme Being in a monistic religion that views all of reality as one being? This is simply another desperate attempt at pattern searching. Krishna was born of a chaste virgin. Jesus was born of a chaste virgin. Edwin Yamauchi rebuts, quote, That's not accurate. Krishna was born to a mother who already had seven previous sons, as even his own followers will readily concede, end quote. Furthermore, the virgin birth is not a new concept invented by Christians. The book of Isaiah, written about 700 BC, spoke of a messiah who would be born of a virgin, and the Septuagint translation would make this more explicit. This prophecy was in circulation 700 years before Jesus, and at least 100 years before Krishna. The distinguished professor of Hinduism, Vasudhanaryan, and PhD, University of Bombay, responds, quote, I've never heard of Krishna being born of a virgin, either through Sanskrit or vernacular text, or even folklore. I can't imagine why people would sit back and cook up all these conspiracies." End quote. 
The moment Krishna was born, the whole cave was splendidly illuminated. The moment Jesus was born, there was a great light in the cave. The Gospels never say that Jesus was born in a cave. This is a post-first century extra-canonical tradition. Also, there's no statement anywhere that the birthplace of Jesus was filled with light. In addition, they are wrong when they claim that Krishna was born in a cave. The primary Hindu texts are inescapably clear that he was born in a prison. It's one of the foundations of the Krishna narrative. As Kamsa had imprisoned his parents in order that he may kill each of Devaki's babies as she birthed them, so that Krishna would never grow to kill him as had been prophesied. The divine child Krishna was recognized and adored by cowherds who prostrated themselves before the heaven-born child. No mention of shepherds or wise men appear at Krishna's birth. Again, Krishna was born in a prison. Kamsa had been told that Devaki's eighth son would kill him. So after he had slaughtered the newborn seventh infant of Devaki in the prison, he was awaiting the birth of the eighth child so that he could kill it immediately. Devaki bore Krishna in secret in the prison and kept him hidden. If anyone had appeared to adore the newborn Krishna, they would have alerted Kamsa that the child had been born. The gods then put the guards to sleep, opened the prison, and Krishna was escaped by his father. The ruler of the country in which Krishna was born, having been informed of the birth of the divine child, sought to destroy him. For this purpose, he ordered the massacre in all his states of all the children of the male sex born during the night of the birth of Krishna. As we have stated, in Purana Yadava tradition, Kamsa, who is the ruler of the Varshini kingdom, is made aware that his assassination has been predicted to occur at the hands of the eighth son of Devaki. So he imprisons the newly wed parents of Krishna and murders each of their children as it is born. And unlike Herod, who issued a decree to slaughter all males under two years old, the Hindu version tells us Kamsa only targeted Devaki's sons. Quote, Thus the six sons were born to Devaki, and Kamsa too killed these six sons consecutively as they were born. End quote. Krishna was crucified, and he is represented with arms extended hanging on a cross. Jesus was crucified, and he is represented with arms extended hanging on a cross. This is a joke. According to the Mahabharata, Book 16, Marusala Parava, Krishna died after being shot in the foot by a hunter named Jara because he was mistaken for a deer. Dr. Edwin Bryant, professor of Hinduism at Rutgers University, is a scholar on Hinduism. He has just recently translated the Bhagavata Purana for Penguin World Classics and is currently writing a book to be titled In Quest of Historical Krishna. When he was asked if Krishna had ever been crucified, Dr. Bryant replied, quote, That is absolute and complete nonsense. There is absolutely no mention anywhere which alludes to a crucifixion, end quote. He also added that Krishna died and ascended. It was not a resurrection. And the sages who came there for Krishna could not really see his ascension. Krishna descended into hell. Jesus descended into hell. As we have stated, this is nonsense. He died and ascended non-bodily. And Jesus never descended into hell either. That's a myth that is never stated in the Bible and comes from a misquotation of the Apostles' Creed. Krishna, after being put to death, rose again from the dead. Jesus, after being put to death, rose again from the dead. As Dr. Bryant has already stated, there was no bodily resurrection of Krishna, and such an idea is foreign to Hinduism. Quote, Jar targeted them, Krishna's feet, with his bow, and discharged an arrow. Lo, it pierced the left foot of sleeping Shri Krishna, who started up, saw blood oozing out from his foot, and felt a sharp pain. Who, he wondered, could inflict such pain on me? Jar came close and recognized Shri Krishna. Jara removed the arrow from Shri Krishna's foot. Shri Krishna collapsed the Gandava with his right hand and looked at Arjuna. His spirit left his body, in quote. Jesus ascended into a physical realm, heaven. Krishna transcended into a mental state, or the inconceivable region. Concepts of heaven and nirvana differ greatly. Krishna is to come again on earth in the latter days. He will appear among mortals as an armed warrior riding a white horse. At his approach, the sun and moon will be darkened, the earth will tremble, and the stars fall from the firmament. That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. There's no concept of an end times or latter days in Hinduism, nor eternal damnation. There is an offer of $1,000 to anyone who can provide a pre-Christian Hindu text substantiating this nonsense claim. But let's take another look. Let's go back 10,000 years before Jesus and look at the 16 other men that came along who claimed to be the Son of God, who were born of a virgin mother. And the virgin mother had the name of Mary, or a derivative of the word Mary. 
who began their ministry at the age of 30, who ended their ministry at the age of 33, and who were killed on the cross. This happened in 16 different events prior to Jesus. Let's look at who they were. Although he recognizes the school to be dead in the academic world, one of the only scholars who still gives credence in support of the mythicist position is the atheist historian Richard Carrier. Maxwell Partridge and Jenkins are about to start quoting verbatim from Kirsty Graves' book, The World's Sixteen Crucified Saviors, and Richard Carrier, who is sympathetic to its thesis, was asked what he thought of the book on a popular atheist radio program. Let's hear what this mythicist has to say about this book Maxwell is citing. I learned that many arguments in the book are overstated, and many of the parallels between Jesus and previous pagan gods aren't as clear-cut as some portray them to be. Now, as a historian and a person who is familiar with the primary text, what is your assessment of the degree of similarity between the story told of Jesus' life in the Gospels and the stories of older pagan gods? Yeah. First, uh, let me say something about Freakin' Candy's book. Okay. I do not recommend that book. <laughs> I would prefer that no one ever read it. <laughs> wow. uh, it's only marginally better than Percy Graves' work. Uh, my <laughs> criticisms of his 16 Crucified Saviors, which you can find at the secular web, apply almost as much to Freakin' Gandhi. Uh, their research is a key part, it's shoddy, and their source citation is minimal, it's problematic. Although they do say a lot more than Graves uh, that is correct, but there's no way to know when they've gotten something right or wrong without redoing all their research, which makes their book useless. And that's the same complaint I had to get to Graves' book. To, to figure out what's in there that's even correct, you have to completely redo the whole work, and you know why even read the book if you're just going to do all the work yourself anyway? Right. Uh, I don't also, I, you know, just in general, I see no reason to believe the Christian Eucharist is a copy of any pagan ritual per se. I, I think it's far more likely that it's a clever modification of Jewish sacrificial theology. And though it resembles many pagan ideas, these ideas were actually common throughout ancient Near Eastern cultures, including Judaism, for centuries before the Common Era. So you don't really have to look any farther than Judaism uh, and its it, pre Christian pagan influences to find where these ideas come from. Of course, understanding the ubiquity of these similar ideas in the surrounding cultures does help put the Jewish ideas in context. It's not a question of like literal direct borrowing from any particular cult. I mean, it's not like Christians went and studied Mithraism and said, oh, we're going to make a religion based on this. That's <laughs> right. not how it happened. And I'd say that applies to all parallels that are shown for between Jesus and other uh, pagan deities. I mean, I think we need to first look for a full and sufficient basis already in Hellenized Jewish thought. I mean, you're talking about how the life of Jesus could be constructed from pagan gods. I think it can be done even better from the Old Testament. Carrier concludes in his online review of the book by dismissing it, quote, The world's 16 crucified saviors, or Christianity before Christ, is unreliable. Most scholars immediately recognize many of his findings as unsupported and dismiss graves as useless. After all, a scholar who rarely cites a source isn't useful to have as a reference." End quote. Let me just say in advance that I had a devil of a time tracking down a great deal of this information. Graves chooses the most obscure variant names for these gods as possible, and he intentionally mistransliterates most of them. If you track down what sources he has, which for the most part are excluded to Godfrey Higgins, they don't help much at all. Little was known about Graves until 2004, when John Benedict Boucher published his article, Who was Kirsty Graves? Boucher exposed the blatantly biased and sloppy nature of Graves' research, illustrating that he did no original work in examining ancient religion. Graves had little formal schooling and, quote, virtually no foreign language training and no direct access to original sources. Graves' primary source was the master Freemason, self-described faithless worshipper and amateur antiquarian Godfrey Higgins, who, like Massey, was also a high chief druid. Graves, of course, had very little formal schooling or language training, so we are forced to come to the conclusion that he is arbitrarily misspelling these names for a reason. Take, for example, his spelling of the Celtic god Esus as Jesus, which Partridge milks with a Spanish accent. As we have already said, Krishna is Sanskrit meaning dark, and the name was given to Krishna by a priest due to his dusty skin color. Esus is Gaulish and means the Lord or Master. Jesus, of course, comes from the original Aramaic Yeshua, meaning Yahweh is salvation, which is translated as Eusis in Greek, then the J was added when it was transliterated into the German. I nor anyone else has been able to find any mention of an Iowa of Nepal, nor has anyone ever been able to find any reference anywhere to an Egyptian god named Thulis. For several years, Tectonics.org has put out an offer asking for any reference to a creed of Chaldea, and no one has yet been able to provide any information on such a god, 
and I haven't been able to come up with any information on Hindu Sakya either, so I won't be able to speak on them. Now we are specifically told that every single one of these gods had a mother with the name Mary, or a derivative of the name Mary. Krishna's mother was Devaki, meaning black. Tammuz's mother was Situr, which simply means maiden. Vitoba, more commonly spelled Vitoba, was the son of Satyavati. Satyavati means truthful. We have very few texts on Esses, most of which are post-Christian. None I can find make any mention of his mother or his birth. In one version, Quetzalcoatl is the son of Kohakatl, which means mother of the gods. And in another, he is the son of Soki Chetzel, which means flower feather. Quinerius was the son of Ray Sylvia. Prometheus was the son of Clemena, meaning renown. Indra's mother was the earth goddess Prifti, which is Sanskrit for earth. Alcestis was either the daughter of an Exibia or Philomenke, who died giving birth to her. Addis was born of the nymph Nanda through Zeus. The name Nana means grace or favor. Bali was the son of Victor. Mithras, as we will go on to see, emerged fully grown from a rock and had no mother. We are told that they were all virgin born. Again, not even close. As we have shown, the Hindu texts explicitly agreed that Krishna was the eighth child of Devaki. As for the claim that he died at the age of 33, he actually died at the age of 125. Tammuz is the less common translation of the word Demuzi. If you read the primary text of the courtship of Ayana and Demuzi, it's pretty obvious that his mother was no virgin. Quote, He who is born from a fertile womb, he who is conceived on the sacred marriage throne, Demuzi, the shepherd, he will go to bed with you, Ayana. Ayana, do not start a quarrel. My father Inki is as good as your father Nana, and my mother Sitter is as good as your mother Ningal. Tammuz wasn't a rabbi who began any sort of ministry. He was a literal shepherd. Jesus was only a shepherd, fisherman, and reaper all in a figurative sense. His vocation was carpentry. As for Vitoba, there is no reason to believe that Junodev and Satyavati had not consummated their marriage, as they are described as an elderly married couple by the time Vitoba comes on the scene. I can find no reference to Satyavati being a virgin, and he doesn't begin any sort of a ministry. The Hindu narrative simply involves the gods being impressed by his devotion to his parents. I don't believe there is a description of Essus' mother in any ancient text. He was a Celtic god of war to whom the Roman historians say human sacrifices were regularly made. He was identified with the god Mars by the Romans, certainly not a Christly figure by any stretch. As far as Quinerius is concerned, Amulus forces his mother Ray Sylvia to perpetual virginity as a vestal priestess, but Livy tells us that she is seduced anyways and gives birth to Quinerius. In one variation of the story Mars, the god of war seduces and impregnates her, in another Amulus himself seduces her, and in yet another version Hercules. Thus, the myth explicitly extrudes any possible pretension of a virgin birth, and stresses the converse. She claims she was brutally raped, but the king doesn't buy it and becomes angry with her for forsaking her virginity. This is why her two children are left to die in the wilderness and are raised by a wolf as the myth famously portrays. Quote, the Vestal presently gave birth to twins. The result she claimed a violent rape. She named Mars as their father, either because she really believed it, or because she felt that putting the responsibility on a god would lessen her own dishonor. End quote. You don't need to take an introductory course in Greek mythology to know that Prometheus was born of Clemene, who had sex with the titan Iapetus, which is what qualifies him as a titan. Prometheus was the brother of Atlas. The Theogony texts explicitly say his parents had intercourse, quote, Iapetus led away the girl Clemene, an Oceanid, and they went together in the same bed, and she bore him a child, stout-hearted Atlas. She brought forth Minotus, a very great renown, and devious and clever Prometheus. Indira was born of the sky god Deos Pita and the fertility goddess Prithvi, fully grown in Arb from his mother's side. There is nothing in the text to lead us to the conclusion that she was a virgin. He was a god of war and storms. The idea that he started a ministry on earth among mortals and was killed by crucifixion is ridiculous. Alcestis is a famous Greek play by Euripides, in which Alcestis' mother dies giving birth. Her father was King Pelias and she was not a god, nor did she claim to be a quote, son of god, or start any sort of ministry. There is no statement in the play that signifies a virgin birth. You can read the play at the link in the description section. Concerning Attis, in the primary version, Dionysus castrates Agistus, and the resulting blood gives birth to a pomegranate tree. Nana comes, she sees the tree and slips one of the pomegranates into her dress and finds herself pregnant with Attis. In return, Attis later dies by castrating himself at his own wedding, and this is the reason why the Gali priests castrated themselves. We are told that the tree represents male fertility in the myth, and because it is a mixture of his blood and semen, it is not a virgin birth. I can find nothing hinting at a virgin birth or miraculous birth for Bali in any way. Edwin M. Yamauchi was invited to deliver a paper at the Second International Congress of Mithraic Studies in Tehran, a conference hosted by the then Empress of Iran. 
He states, quote, Those who seek to reduce Mithra as the prototype of the risen Christ ignore the late date for the expansion of Mithraism to the West. We have almost no evidence of Mithraism in the sense of a mystery religion in the West until very late, too late to have influenced the beginnings of Christianity. The earliest Mithraea are dated to the early 2nd century. There are a handful of inscriptions that date to the early 2nd century, but the vast majority of texts are dated after AD 140. Most of what we have as evidence of Mithraism comes in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries AD. That's what's wrong with theories about Mithraism influencing the beginning of Christianity. He states, quote, It is definitely not true that Mithras was born of a virgin. He was born out of a rock. The rock birth is commonly depicted in Mithraic beliefs. Mithras emerged fully grown and naked, end quote. Quoting the Encyclopedia of Religion, quote, Mithras, who being in the form of a rock, had no mother whose milk he could drink, is depicted as a baby drinking the juice extruded from bunches of grapes, end quote. Manthrin Kloss, in his book The Roman Cult of Mithras, states, quote, The literary sources are unmistakable. Mithras was known as the rock-born god. The inscriptions confirm this nomenclature. Even one reads, To the Almighty God, Son Invincible, Generative God, Born from the Rock. Mithras also appears in the archaeological record as a rock-born god. Many images represent the god growing out of a rock with both arms raised aloft. After the bull slaying, the rock birth is the most frequently represented event in the myth. Being that he was born from a rock, it is false to say that he was a, quote, son of God. And unless rocks can be considered virgins, we can send that claim to the flames as well. Also, as Yamauchi states, Mithras was a god, not a teacher. He began no ministry. The only god here that could be considered a virgin is Quetzalcoatl, who ironically was an ancient South American god of the Maya, and therefore could have absolutely no influence on the ancient Near East, on the other side of the world. I made a list of all the claims about the god Quetzalcoatl in Graves' book and this film, and sent it to the Mayanist scholar Dr. Alan J. Christensen, who works in the translation of the Mayan text and has published numerous scholarly works on Mayan culture and religion, most notably his foundational translation of Popol Vuh. I asked him if any of the claims made by Graves or the film were true, to which he replied, quote, How do you comment on this kind of nonsense? It's hardly worth wasting one's time. The only thing that could possibly be applicable is virgin birth. Though that's hardly astonishing. The birth of the hero twins in Popol Vuh should perhaps be more precisely characterized as a miraculous birth. But a case could be made, I suppose. I contacted David Friedel, the academic archaeologist, minus and anthropology professor at Washington University. He responded to the list by stating, quote, Thank you for bringing this interesting work to my attention. I teach a course on pseudoscience and pseudo-history and archaeology, and this will prove most relevant. Roman execution has its visual parallels in Mesoamerica, but death was rendered by means other. I know of nothing to support the idea that Quetzalcoatl experienced this kind of sacrifice. The Maya maze god was decapitated. Given that the name of Graves' book is the World 16 Crucified Saviors Before Christ, we should much expect that these gods were crucified. Of course, not one I can possibly find was. As we have shown, Krishna died after being shot in the foot by a hunter while meditating. Richard Carey dismisses Graves, quote, Almost all his sources on Krishna long post-date Christian Nocetarian influence on India. No Christian text on Krishna contains the details crucial to his case. Tammuz saved, but not from sin. He saved from starvation and physical death. He never looked upon as one to rescue from eternal damnation. His death occurred at the end of the spring. He was killed by the gods of the thunderstorm as a symbol for the crop cycle, not crucified. The primary Sumerian text tells how Ayanna journeyed to the underworld and was commanded that she may escape only if she finds another person to take her place in death. She is allowed to return to the land of the living to find a replacement only on the condition that two demons escort her. She returns to find Tammuz not mourning her death and sitting on his throne well dressed. In anger, she commands the demons to take him. Tammuz is struck on the cheek with a piercing nail, then with the shepherd's crook. He drops dead. In another later version of the myth where he is represented as Adonis, he dies by being gored by a wild boar, as accounted by Ovid in his Metamorphosis. Was Tammuz resurrected afterwards? Yamauchi states, quote, In the case of the Mesopotamian Tammuz, or Sumerian Damuzi, his alleged resurrection by the goddess Ayana Ishtar had been assumed even though the end of the Sumerian and Akkadian texts of the myth of the descent of Ayana had not been preserved. Professor S. N. Kramer in 1960 published a new poem, The Death of Damuzi, which proves conclusively that instead of rescuing Damuzi from the underworld, Ayana sent him there as her substitute. This gives us the irrefutable evidence for the death of Tammuz and the necessity of him to remain dead." End quote. Yamauchi also states, quote, Tammuz was identified by later writers with the Phoenician Adonis, the beautiful youth beloved of Aphrodite. P. Lampkritz has shown that there is no trace of a resurrection in the early text or pictorial representations of Adonis.
Recycling graves, Acharya S. claimed that Witoba was crucified, to which Dr. Edwin Bryant, the previously mentioned Hindu scholar at Rutgers, responded, quote, She doesn't know what she's talking about. Vitoba was a form of Krishna worshipped in the state of Maharashtra. There are absolutely no Indian gods portrayed as crucified. Bryant then indignantly said, quote, If someone is going to go on the air and make statements about religious tradition, they should at least read a Religion 101 course, end quote. Graves gives a date of Eusis at 834 BC, but it's hard to imagine where that date could have come from. The earliest record of Eusis comes from the historian Lucian, writing in the 1st century AD after Jesus. As far as I'm aware, no source ever mentions Eusis as dying, and as David Friedwell has already noted, Quetzalcoatl wasn't crucified but was decapitated. According to Plutarch and Livy, Quinarius mysteriously disappeared in the darkness of a sudden storm while offering a public sacrifice at an assembly he was holding at Campus Meritus. One tradition reports that he was murdered by senators, his body dismembered and the pieces hidden underneath their togas. Another reports that he rose into heaven. There is no mention of a crucifixion. As for Prometheus being a crucified savior, he did the exact opposite by introducing death on mankind. Klaus Peter Koping in the Encyclopedia of Religion states, quote, He removes humankind from the state of innocence, as well as from barbarism, the eating of raw meat, by introducing knowledge and crafts, but he brings mortality as well, end quote. We are told that Prometheus was crucified by Zeus, but this is terribly misleading. He was chained to the side of a mountain by Zeus, only to have a giant eagle eat his ever-regenerating liver daily. Graves claims that this narrative of Prometheus was invented by Christians as a cover-up, but that's impossible being that the Aetulus, which contains the narrative, was written five centuries before Christ. In the Hindu myths, particularly the Rig Veda, Indra never dies. His hall is the great celestial realm to which great nobles and warriors go at death. In one later text, he is bound to serpent nooses and humiliated by the demon Indirat, but he is never killed. Alcestis is the main female character of the Greek love play. She never begins a ministry or anything of the sort, and she did not claim to be a son of God. Her beloved husband is condemned to die by the venom of snakes in his bed, yet Apollo makes a deal with the gods of the fates that someone may die in his place. No one offers, not even his elderly parents, so Alcestis offers to die for him. We are told in Euripides' play that she dies in her bed with maidens watching. The claim that Attis was crucified is completely false and there is a $2,000 reward if you can provide any such primary text. Attis castrates himself beneath a pine tree after he is made to go insane before his wedding by Agistus. His blood flows into the ground from a severed organ and brings forth a patch of violence, then he dies. His bride who sees this commits suicide as well, and her blood likewise turns to violence. Yamauchi adds, quote, It has been shown that Attis, the consort of Sybil, does not appear as a, quote, resurrected god until after AD 50, end quote. I can't find a reference to a death of Mahabali, only that he was bound in ropes on one occasion and that he achieved moksha, which is the Hindu equivalent to nirvana. I won't comment on an alleged crucifixion for him. Outside of graves, I can't find the claim anywhere. Yamauchi states in regard to Mithras, quote, Mithras didn't sacrifice himself, he killed a bull. I know of no reference to his supposed death and resurrection, end quote. Richard Gordon declares in his book, Image and Value in the Greco-Roman World, page 96, that there was, quote, no death of Mithras, and thus there cannot be a resurrection. So when you hear Christians talking about the last days and the end of the world and the end times, we're talking about the end of the age of Pisces. We're talking about, yes, the end times, the end of the age of Pisces, and the coming age of the man with the water pitcher. Now, when the end of the age of Pisces is coming, and we will be going into the new age of Aquarius, oh, but that's devil worship, that's evil, that's astrology. No, that's the Bible. They had this really long, drawn-out portion where they teach the New Age doctrine that Jesus and various portions of the Bible represent ages, and that we are moving into the age of Pisces. I'm going to play a clip from Keith Thompson's documentary Refuting Zeitgeist that makes short work of all of this. Jesus ushered in the age of Pisces, or the age of two fish, unquote. Then Aquarius with Luke 22, verse 10. 
They spend five long minutes on this, going through the Bible verses and giving their theory and inducting people into the New Age movement, explaining how supposedly Aquarius is in the Bible as being an age and the Jesus fish supposedly representing Pisces. Zeitgeist is fast to explain that, quote, and ancient societies were very aware of this, unquote. They make sure to say that because their whole theory and that whole five minutes hinges on the idea that the ancients acknowledged the astronomical concept they refer to. If it turns out that this age concept is a modern concept, their whole theory falls apart and that whole five minutes was a big waste of time. As Dr. Noel Swerdlow, the professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago and who received the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, often referred to as the Genius Grant, remarks, quote, the modern ideas about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius are based upon the location of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations, but the regions, the borders between. Those constellations are a completely modern convention of the International Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping and never had any astrological significance. I hope this is helpful, although in truth what this woman is claiming is so wacky that it is hardly worth answering. So when this woman says that the Christian fish was a symbol of the coming age of Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought of in antiquity. To name another anachronism that appears to underline her interpretation, the borders of constellations between, say, Aries, Pisces, and Aquarius are modern conventions of the International Astronomical Union, and there is nothing ancient about them. Ancient astrologers did not use Norton's star atlas or anything else that drew arbitrary lines between side rail constellations. The location of the equinox among one or another zodiacal constellation as the so-called age of Aquarius or age of Pisces is something of concern to modern astrology but is never mentioned as significant in ancient astrology. It is simply anachronistic to believe that what is important to 20th century astrology was of importance to ancient astrology." Unquote. This means Zeitgeist's argumentation regarding the various astrological ages is irrelevant. In other words, the ancient Christ conspirators could not have recognized the twelve celestial sections in order to incorporate them into a Christian myth and announce the ushering in of the age of Pisces, because the division into the celestial sections did not occur until a meeting of the International Astronomical Union in the 20th century. Well, and that's why Christians have the fish on the back of the card, Dagon, the fish god of Rome. In regard to the Jesus fish, former professional astrologer for eight years, Marcia Montenegro states, quote, the fish was an early symbol of Christ because the Greek word based on the initials of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, spelled fish. Good old Jordy is about to repeat his spiel about how the sun dies on December 25th and Christianity is a representation of sun worship. This idea, of course, would find wider expression in the Marxist film Zeitgeist. That in winter, as the sun moved further south, bringing, of course, our winter, that winter represents death. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolize the process of death. The coldness of death. And they noticed that when the sun went south, that it reached a point where it stopped in its movement and did not move any further south. And they began to notice on their sundials that it not only didn't go any further south, but it didn't begin to move back north either for three days. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. For three days the sun sat exactly on the sundial in the same place. Therefore the ancients said that the Son of God dies for three days and is resurrected or brought back to life once it begins its annual journey back to the Northern Hemisphere. And when it begins its annual journey back to the Northern Hemisphere was on December 25th. Therefore the God's Son, the light of the world, who is our salvation because he is risen, was born or reborn on December 25th. December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. 
And thus it was said, The Son died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. After a while, this stuff gets just so ridiculous that it's hardly worth giving a serious response. The issue here is that nowhere in the Bible is it ever indicated that Jesus was born on December 25th. Early Christians celebrated Jesus' birth on January 6th, and in some areas January 7th. December 25th was a date picked in the 4th century by the Roman Catholic Church as an alternative to the Roman Saturnalia Festival, which was indeed connected with the winter solstice. But even they knew it had nothing to do with Jesus' actual birth date. We can know that winter is the last time the Bible indicates that Jesus would have been born, because we are told that the shepherds were in their fields. In Palestine it's quite cold in the winter, and shepherds were not in the fields at that time. In addition, Maxwell's claim that the symbol of the Christian cross comes from the zodiac cross is equally ridiculous, since that would imply that the Roman invention somehow is based on the zodiac. Then you have the insane claim that Jesus' crucifixion story is a myth, as if a crucified failure of a messiah is something that first century Jews would have made up. Not to mention John Dominic Crossan, for example, who's a non-Christian historical Jesus scholar, states, quote, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be, end quote. Then you have to deal with the issue of the 42 early sources that mention Jesus and his crucifixion, many of which are non-Christian Roman historians living at that time. Then you have the issue that we have over four times the number of sources for Jesus within 150 years of his life than we have for the Roman emperor contemporary with him. Then you have to realize that this whole stupid argument depends on a pun between the English words for son, S-O-N, and son, S-U-N. This, of course, only works in the English language. On the point of the sun staying almost fixed for three days, on the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of December, I'll read from badastronomy.com. Although the sun does hang out to the south, you could pick four or more days and not notice much change. However, if three days was preferred for some reason, then it wouldn't be the days they claim, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Since the solstice is on the 22nd at 6 a.m., then it would be the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd as the most southern three days. This is a good opportunity to try to explain what's going on here, because if you understand the concept I'm about to say, then a lot of this is going to all of a sudden make sense to you. First, you have to understand that sun worship has been around for a long time. But usually, it's not exactly them worshiping the sun, but something that the sun represents. Now, you have to understand that those people took over Christianity 400 years after trying to completely destroy it. Rome, all of a sudden, had a change of heart, and then became Christianity, or rather, this monster that said that they were Christianity. And they chose a date for the birthday of Jesus. And the date that they chose was chosen because of its connection to the sun. They did other things, too. This is also when you start to find depictions of Jesus with halos and other obvious references to the zodiac and sun worship. You have to understand that this stuff doesn't prove that Jesus was a sun god. It only proves that sun worshippers were paying artists to depict Jesus more to their liking. There's a lot more to talk about about this astrotheology, but we'll save that for other parts. But I do want to say this. There's not a clear definition. Um, I know that Acharya S. on a recent movie has alluded to the fact that the reason that there's no Wikipedia entry for astrotheology is because of censorship, because it's somehow the theology no one wants you to know about. Well, I'll suggest that the reason that there's no Wikipedia entry is because there's no information on it. I, I would think that the Wikipedia entry would go something like this. Astrotheology is a term that Jordan Maxwell came up with out of absolutely nowhere, and Michael Tessarian started selling books and DVDs and $75 I Love Astrotheology t-shirts. I'll leave you with this. The main cheerleaders for astrotheology always tell us to do our homework, yet they're telling us lies that could only work if we're completely ignorant to the facts. So I just wanted to point out that this can all be stopped by us becoming more informed. Stop being walked all over by the mystery schools and told what to think and told who to hate. It's not up to them to tell you who to hate. They're using two-bit lies to do so. Stand up and say you're not going to take this anymore.